and continue in the book of James, a faith that works. And uh, today we're going to be uh, focusing on uh, when uh, cantankerous Christians collide. We know what it's like when cantankerous politicians collide, don't we? Has anybody been watching the news? I mean, my goodness, cantankerous cr politicians, that's all they do. And they, they just kind of beat up on each other, and it's a brutal, and this has probably been the most brutal of all campaigns, would you say? Yeah, I think so, at least in my lifetime. And, and from what we studied last night, we know it should not be like that in the church, right? Uh, well, what we read last time in, in the book of James, wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure. Then peace-loving, considerate. Doesn't sound like a politician at all, does it? <laughs> Submissive, full of mercy and good fruits. Impartial, sincere. Peacemakers, who sow in peace, and they raise a harvest of righteousness. You might think, with all that, such wisdom from above. I mean, that's what that passage is talking about. When we've got such wisdom from above like that, you would think that the Christian would be free from fighting and quarreling, disagreement, arguing, bickering, and complaining. I mean, wouldn't you? But they are not. And James knows that they're not. He says in chapter 4, verse 1, what causes fights and quarrels among you? After telling them, hey, listen, we have a wisdom that comes from above and everything is so different from what we're seeing in the world. He's saying, that, what, what causes quarrels and fights among you? Why is that going on in the church? Why is that among you Christians? Uh, why are you beating up on each other? Where does such hostility come from? Because it does happen in the church, doesn't it? Yeah, we know that. So where does it all come from? Where does this hostility come from? Well, he answers that there's a source for such cantankerousness. That's a mouthful. He said the source is right here. Pleasure-seeking lust. Don't they come from your desires and battles within you? There's a war going on between your desires and what God desires. Oh, maybe you, you're saying, I, I haven't had that battle. Oh, sure you have. <laughs> You know what God wants, you know what you want, and you got this battle going on. Uh, one translation puts it like this. Is it, <clears throat> is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? What you want is warring. It's going on. Now, it's very interesting that the Greek New Testament word for desire and passions is hedonon, which from which we get hedonism, which means a pursuit of pleasure. Everybody wants things to go the way that pleases them. And if it doesn't please me, well, then I'm going to be a cantankerous person. Uh, some people say, well, I'm going to just pout about it, or I'm going to fight about it, or I'm going to argue about it. I'm going to be disgruntled about it. I want my way what pleases me. And if not, life is going to be miserable for everyone else. That's what he's saying. Cantankerous Christians have a pleasure-seeking lust going on inside. Not just a pleasure-seeking lust. He says, it's a possession-seeking lust. You want something because you think, if I have this something, a hot car, it'll really make me happy and that will really please me, right? right. Or, or maybe it's a, a castle instead of that little hut that I live in. <laughs> if, I just, if I just had a bigger house, okay, then that would make me happy and that would, that would really please me, you see? He says, this possession-seeking lust, he says, well, maybe I need a few toys. Yeah, a yacht or two wouldn't be bad, an airplane. I mean, we could go on and on. The things, you, you see the black hole? You see the black hole in the guy in the, the chest there? In Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says that God has set eternity in our hearts. I call that a black hole. God has put inside of every single one of us an element of eternity. And, and, and what we try to do is I try to take a house and put it in there. Doesn't, doesn't fill it up. 
there must be more. A, a, a car. Many of you bought a new car and it's been really, really wonderful and you love it and you think it's the greatest thing until the new smell wears off and the payments start rolling in. And it loses its lure because it just doesn't fill the hole. The big, huge eternity set in your heart. So, so you, you, you work on a relationship and you think, if I just had this relationship, it would fill me inside and just fill me up. And, and, and that doesn't happen. And then you say, if I just had a job or a career and an education, and we try to fill this big black hole inside called eternity, the only thing that can fill that up is eternity. Jesus Christ is the eternal one. And unless you have Jesus Christ filling that up, You've invited him into your life, and he dwells in our hearts by faith. Unless I have a faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, everything in this world, though it may satisfy for a moment, winds up being just empty. It's like a roller coaster. That first time you ride a roller coaster, it is so exhilarating. I went with the youth to uh, Cedar Point, and I, I rode the roller coasters. But you know how a roller coaster is. It's exhilarating the first time, but every time you write, every time after that, it gets less exhilarating, less exhilarating, less exhilarating. It's just, well, I've done that before. And that's what happens. We try to fill everything up and, and nothing fills. And because nothing is filling and nothing is satisfying and I'm trying to get more, I become cantankerous because somebody else has something better and bigger than I have and I don't have it and I want it and I have this lust inside. It is a possession-seeking lust and it says you want something but you don't get it because even when you got what you want, it's not enough. Does that make sense? That's how it works. So we become cantankerous. We wind up possessionless. Nothing satisfies. Nothing satisfies. He says you kill and you covet. It is amazing to me what the politicians will go through in order to get what they want. You know what really amazes me? Is what some Christians will go through to get what they want rather than what God wants. You kill, you covet, but you cannot have what you want, you're possessionless. You just don't get it. You're not going to get it. You see, it is a pointless seeking lust. He says, you Christians that he's writing to, he says, you quarrel and you fight. You're, you're operating on that horizontal level. Wisdom from below, not wisdom from above, from the previous passage in the scripture. He says, you do not have, that's, it's so pointless. Everything you're doing is pointless because it never fills that black hole, never satisfies, and you just become cantankerous and you, you just become a person nobody wants to be around because you do not ask God. You're not praying. You're not praying. When we're prayerless, how can we expect to get anything? We're prayerless. We're wanting, not getting. We're not praying, not getting answers. When you ask, he says, you do not receive. You're totally powerless. Because even when you pray, you're not getting what you want. You're powerless. Your prayers are empty. They're void. They're... Uh, Possessionless. They, they don't get answers that you're asking for. You're powerless. Why? Well, I prayed. I prayed. And it, it didn't happen. He says, you're powerless seeking lust, he says. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. We view God like the vending machine in the sky. <laughs> I pull out this little prayer that I learned. It's, uh, give me this, give me that, give me the other thing too. Uh, give me this, give me that, and give me what he has too. And we, we pop that little prayer as the coin in the machine, and we pull the lever, and we expect God to give us 
what our self-centered hearts want. That's what he says. You ask with the wrong motives. When you pray, it's all about you. Try this sometime. Try doing a prayer where you never say I. I tell you, I've tried this. It's really, really hard. And I know if it's hard for the preacher, it's got to be hard for everybody else too. Pray without saying I. God, I, I would like, oh, man, bite my tongue. You see, prayer, you've got to realize whose presence you're going into. We're going into the presence of Almighty God. We should be so humbled and so low instead of saying, ha, 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 God, here I am. Aren't you, aren't you blessed that I've come into your presence today? You see, it's a wrong motive. Uh, God, you need to give me this, 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 because if you do, I will be an outstanding Christian. Like, I got leverage on God? Are you kidding me? He says, you come with the wrong motive so that you may spend it on your own pleasures. You know what it's like? It's like you view God like he's Santa Claus up in the sky. And you give Santa Claus your wish list. Santa Claus, God, I want this for Christmas. God, I want this, 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 and this. And here, and I'm expecting it. And if you don't do that, I'm not going to believe you're God. Are you kidding me? If you don't believe God, does that stop him from being God? No way. God is God whether you believe it or not. God is God if he doesn't answer your petty wish list because prayer is not about you. It's really not about me. It's about God bringing glory to who he is. He's God. And I humble myself before him and I don't put out this list of all my wants. I put out my list. God, what do you want for me in my life? I'm ready to receive it. And when we're ready to receive what God wants for us, our lives will be full of blessings. We won't be asking amiss. We won't be asking to fulfill my own pleasures. We won't be saying, you know, often we, we pray. You know, the Apostle Paul was in, in prison many times. Every time he'd go to a town and preach, he wound up in jail. You never once find Paul praying, God, get me out of this jail. Not once. He said, God, make me a witness right here where I am. You put me in these circumstances. You know, when, when Paul was sick, he didn't say, God, uh, heal me and then I'll go be a good Christian. He said, well, God, use my infirmity. Maybe, maybe there must be a, a doctor or a nurse I must, must need to witness to. You see, he never saw it as about him. He saw it as being about God. And when I get my motive changed around, that it's not about me and it's all about God, everything changes in my prayer life. And all of a sudden, my prayers get answered huge huge. You see, the reality of cantankerous Christians, there are cantankerous Christians. I just won't put that out there. They're not all going to go according to uh, the wisdom that's from above. God's word calls cantankerous Christians by names. First of all, first one, he says, you adulterous people. Now, there are literal adulterers, those who are cheating on their spouse. That's adultery. You're having a sexual relationship with someone other than your spouse. That, that, that is an adulterous relationship. But I think he's talking here in a spiritual way. He's saying, you spiritual adulterers. You claim to be in a relationship with God and you're constantly cheating on him. Guy was about to propose to his uh, fiance to be. He gets down on one knee, romantic situation, on the beach, nice sunset. He's reaching his pocket. He's got the ring. He's about to pop it on the girl. And he says to her, he says, listen, I will be the best husband who ever was. He said, I, 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 will, I will be the best father who could ever be. I will provide for you. I'll provide for the children. I said, I will really die for you. I will be faithful to you. Except one day of the year, I'd like to still go out with my girlfriend from uh, two years ago. What's wrong with that proposal? Everything. He's a cheater from the get-go. Nobody's going to say, yes, I'll marry you. Why? Unfaithful. He's saying, hey, you, you Christians, cantankerous Christians, you're cheating on God. You're cheating on God. 
When you're fighting with another Christian, you're cheating on God because that person he's already said is an image bearer of God. That's a person for whom Christ died. That's a person that Christ loves. How could you ever war, quarrel, covet, lust, and cheat? All of that over that other person. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world? You see, often a Christian has his foot planted in two realms, the world and the heavenly realm. The world and the heavenly realm. And you, you can't love God on the one hand and mammon on the other, money on the other. You, you can't love the Lord and, and say, I'm a citizen of heaven, and, and say, I'm going to live like the world. No, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. We are to be so radically different, so countercultural, that people will say, there's an oddball. That, that person must be a Christian. Don't you know that friendship with the world is actually hatred, hatred, toward God. That's powerful language. When I'm compromising, I live one way on Sunday and I live a different way on Monday (laughs) or any other day. When I'm compromising, we do so much to discredit the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we basically saying, I hate you, God. You ever seen a little child with a temper tantrum say to the parent, I hate you. And you know that they're just not getting their way and they're just so immature. Isn't that the way we are? We're just wayward, temper tantrum children, screaming. He says, don't you know it's hatred towards God? Don't you know, he says, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. It's like we've taken the can and, oh, I'm gonna blast this other person. I'm cantankerous. I'm gonna really let them have it. He says, don't you know that Jesus steps right in front of that person because that's the person for whom he died and everything you're, do, you're throwing and you're attacking that person, you're really attacking me. You've made me your, your enemy. And I've used this gal last week, the, the, the envious gal. She's green with envy. <laughs> or do you think the scripture says without reason that the spirit... Uh, He caused to live in us, envies intensely. God's given us a spirit, and he also has given us freedoms, and we can use that, that spirit that we have in multiple ways, and one of those ways is to envy. It envies. And I talked last week about how envious uh, this woman that came into the church was, that it made her literally demon-like. She was crazy. He's saying... You don't have to be that way. But when you're cantankerous, you're just like that. You're just like that. He gives us more grace. That is why the scriptures say, God opposes the proud. I got a proud peacock here. And sometimes we get so proud about who we are. But he says he opposes the proud. And he gives grace to the humble. Actually, in the Proverbs is where this is taken from. Says he mocks proud mockers, but he gives grace to the humble. And one other place in, the, in, in Corinthians, the Apostle Paul says, Let him who stands take heed lest he fall. Don't get proud because uh, you're doing really well at the moment, because in the next moment you might be falling. Pride comes before the fall. Watch your heart. Don't get all puffed up. Don't say how wonderful I am. Here's the solution to be a cantankerous person. All those are the characteristics of one. They're adulterous, they're proud, they're all of those things, okay? He says, here's the solution. But he gives us more grace. Grace is the solution. Grace is a gift. That's what the word means. It's a gift. God giving us what we do not deserve. When you think of salvation, none of us deserve to be saved from our sins. None of us. But God in his grace sent his son into the world to take our place on the cross that we might be rescued from our sins by placing faith in Jesus. Grace is an unmerited, undeserved gift. He says, but God gives us more gifts, more grace. He gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He mocks the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Are you getting? God wants to gift you. God wants to bless you. God wants to to give you marvelous gifts. And this grace is found in humility. You have to humble yourself. The word humble means you lower yourself. 
The moment you think that you are better than that other person that you're warring with, you're fighting with, you should rather, that, rather than try to be one up on them, you need to see how can I be one lower than them and serve them. I, I need to humble myself. God gives, gives grace to those who are humble. God gives grace to those who submit. Submit yourself, therefore. Submit yourself then to God. I need to yield and give in. Not to what I want, but what to God wants. And when I humble what God wants, he takes that humble person and he lifts them up. He said, you need to resist. Submit yourself, therefore, to God and resist the devil. The devil, we're told, and Peter is like a roaring lion going about, seeking whom he may devour. He's on a mission to destroy you if you resist him. When Jesus resisted him, he quoted scriptures. He says, it stands written in the word of God. And then he quoted a a verse from the scripture, a verse from the scripture. And when he did that, when he quoted the scripture, the, the enemy, Satan, fled from him. You resist the devil and he will flee from you. He says, grace is also found in approaching God. Come near to God, he says, and he will come near to you. In the book of Hebrews, it says uh, that we are to go boldly to the very throne of grace. Somehow, when I close my eyes and pray, I, 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 I somehow go beyond all spatial limitations and I go to the very throne of God and I'm there somehow in the very presence of the throne of grace and I make my request known to God through prayer. I, I, I pray to God and he comes near to me. How does he do that? Well, he says you do that by washing your hands. You cleanse your hands. We're a cleanliness generation. I don't know if you're aware of that. A lot of people are germophobics. They don't even like when we hold hands at the end of the service when we do the, the uh, uh, Lord's Supper and we all hold hands, there are people who say, I don't want to hold somebody else's hand because I'm afraid of the germs that are on their hand. He says, you wash your hands, you clean your hands. I don't think he's just talking about physically washing your hands here. I think he's saying, your hands are an expression of what you do. Look at what you are doing. What needs to be cleaned up? Wash your hands, you sitters. And he goes on, he says, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Earlier in the book, he said, a double-minded man, a two-souled man, a man going to the world and going to Christ, a world and Christ. He's he's back and forth. He's a double-minded man. He's unstable in everything he does. Everything is unstable in his life. He said, purify your heart so that you get rid of this double-mindedness and you have a single focus and that your focus is on Jesus. If your focus is on Jesus, you'll stop being cantankerous. You will. Grace is found in contrition. He says, grieve, mourn, wail. We don't see these as real positive things in our culture today. But I found this verse in Isaiah. It's very interesting. For this is what the high and lofty one says. This is is what God says. The one who lives forever, whose name is holy, this is the holy God that we worship. He says, I live in a high and holy place. Holy means it is so separate that sinners can't get into it. He says, I dwell in a high and a holy place, but also with him who is of a contrite, that means brokenhearted and lowly in spirit, humble I will revive the spirit of the lowly, the humble person, and I will revive the heart of the contrite, the brokenhearted one. Two places God dwells. Absolute Lord God of the entire universe in heaven, and he dwells with the person who is broken down and humble and said, God, as a song this morning, I'm desperate for you. He dwells there. He dwells there. I worked for years uh, ministering to uh, divorce people in divorce recovery and saw God work so powerfully because often at that crisis juncture in their lives, they were broken down, contrite, and said, God, I'm desperate for you. And there's two places God dwells, high and lofty place, and with that broken down person, he's there. He's there for them. 
Grace is found in contrition. It's found in repenting. Repentance means you're going one direction, you turn around. It's a U-turn. I turn around and I'm going in the other way. It says, change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Listen, you're rejoicing in the wrong things. You should be, I don't know how we do this. We watch TV programs and we laugh about the humor in them that are things contrary to our faith. How can we do that? I've got to change my mind about those. Instead of laugh about that garbage, I should be saying, what has our nation come to? What has the people come to? God, I need to confess our sins that you'll heal our land. You see, change your mind, change your mind. Finally, he says, humble yourself before the Lord. If you humble yourself before the Lord, he will lift you up. He's going to exalt you. He's going to lift you up. That's the promise. When we humble ourselves, he will lift us up. So I want you to take this home with you today. Cantankerous Christians are at war. They are. They got a battle going on, verbal battle. They're fighting their opposition, all that. They're at war with themselves because there's a battle raging with them, in them over their passions. What I want, my pleasure versus what pleases God. There's this battle that's going on inside. They're also at war with others. They're fighting among you. They want what you have to try to fill the black hole that only God can fill. And because they're on the wrong track, they need to get God back into their life so that he fills it and they're satisfied. And thirdly, they're at war with God. Hatred towards God, an enemy of God. We need to put the flag up of surrender and say, Lord, I surrender all. I yield to you. Lord, when I do that, I will counter. I will end the war. I will end the war that's within me. I will end the war with others. And I will end the war with God. You see, you first must surrender. You got to surrender because God's not going to lose this battle. You have to surrender. Then, uh, as it says in James 4 verse 7, submit yourself then to God. You put yourself under the authority of God. And then he will lift you up. He will lift you up. He will lift you up. You don't do it yourself. He does it for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, too often we are the cantankerous ones. And we need to surrender ourselves to you. We need to humble ourselves before you. We need to allow you to lift us up. Not for us to allow our lustful, seeking desires to manifest themselves in ways that are contrary to you. We need to be genuine in our prayer, Lord, that it's not all about me, but focused on you. And what would you have me to do in this circumstance? What would you have me to to have in my life and be satisfied and say it is enough Lord what you've given me and we know when we are contented and satisfied humbled before you you will bless us with even more you will bless us with even more we know you want to bless us as a humble people before you humble our hearts that you might do so in Jesus name Amen